In this lab, we're going to cover network load balancers. Network load balancers are also a new generation. They're similar in many ways to application load balancers. Some of the key differences are, firstly, the protocols that are, that are supported. You can see here, you've only got TCP and TLS. So these are the layer four session layers of the OSI model. An application load balancer operates at level, layer seven only which is HTTP and HTTPS in its case. So you can only use TCP and TLS. Of course, HTTP runs on TCP, so you can still, you can still have uh, web applications running on your EC2 instances and publish them using port 80 or port 443. Um, the difference is that there's no application layer inspection happening on the network load balancer, so some of the smarts and some of the features of the application load balancer aren't possible here, such as the path-based routing and the host-based routing that you saw with the ALB. Um, one of the things you can do is you can terminate TLS connections on the network load balancer. Uh, and we're going to cover that actually in another lab where I go into more detail about setting up secure listeners uh, and also using TLS termination. So one of the other things you may notice that's different with a network load balancer is I've put public IPs and elastic IPs. So the key difference here is with the application load balancer, it does pick up public addresses. They're not visible to you, however. You only see the DNS address. So if it's an internet-facing application load balancer, it does actually have a public IP, but you don't interact with it. You don't know what it is. You only see the DNS name for the application load balancer. With a network load balancer, you can either allow it to AWS to configure a public IP or you can associate an elastic IP so you know exactly what IP address you need. And you can do that on a per subnet level. So let's go back to the console and we're going to build out this simple architecture and learn a bit more about network load balancers. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to upload a couple of files to S3 and you'll see why in a moment. So hopefully you've created a bucket. You won't be able to call it DCT Labs, but you just need to have your own bucket in S3. And then in the course download, you'll find the files that you need here. So I've got names.csv and I've got index.txt. So I'm just gonna upload those. Now what these are is just to make things a bit more fun, what I've done is I've I've created a very simple HTML page. Uh, this will be renamed to index.html on your instances. And then I've got a, a bunch of names here. So this is a file with lots of first names. Um, there's thousands of them in there. And we're going to run a simple script which gives our instance a name so that when we cycle through looking at, at the distribution of connections to our backend instances, we actually have a name for that instance, which makes it a bit easier to sort of identify what's going on. So let's go back over to EC2. I'm going to launch an instance. In fact, I'm going to launch two instances. So let's just go next. We're going to hit two for instances. We need our S3 full access role because remember, we need the role based access here. We're going to use an IAM role in order to be able to authenticate to S3 because we don't want to store any credential information on that, S on that EC2 instance. So I head down to advanced details, and this is where we're going to put our user data. So I'll quickly walk you through this script. And again, this will all be in the course downloads. So again, just as before, we've got the path to the interpreter, we update our packages, we install and enable HTTP uh, web, web, web server, and then we're gonna to change to the HTML directory. And then this is where we copy down those files. So we take the names.csv file and the index, excuse me, that should be .txt file. And next what we do is we create a variable, which is the output of this piece of code here. So we run this code and we assign it to a variable. And what this does is it just goes through this names file and randomly pulls out a name. And what we then do is we go into the index.txt file and we replace the name, the word instance with the actual name that we've assigned from that file. So that just gives a name and then we save it back out as a HTML file. 
Now, there's another way of doing this. Um, if you wanted to, you could quite easily create your own script where you might want to use, for instance, instance metadata. So you could use the instance metadata to pull information such as the instance ID, the IP address, that kind of thing from the instance metadata, and then you could save that into an index.html file or whatever HTML file you want. Um, I think that's a bit harder then to sort of identify as you go through adding new instances, and we're going to use this when we get into the auto scaling as well, and we're going to be launching new instances through auto scaling, and it's much easier to identify that the, a new name has has come up rather than trying to work out which IP address has changed. So hopefully that all works for you. Um, it's really quite simple, um, so that should be okay. Let's just hit launch. And those two instances are going to launch. And so while that's happening, there's another thing I want to do. I just want to come down to Elastic IPs. And I'm going to allocate a new Elastic IP. So there we go. We have an Elastic IP address. And I want to show you how we can associate this with our network load balancer. So let's head down to load balancers now. Click create load balancer. Again, you get the screen that has a bit of information. So let's look at the network load balancer. So, set, so it tells us here to choose a network load balancer when we need ultra high performance, the ability to terminate TLS connections at, stat, at scale, centralized certificate deployment, and static IP addresses for your application. So there's a few differences there from the application load balancer that might push you towards using the network load balancer. It then says that operating at the connection level, network load balancers are capable of handling millions of requests per second while securely while maintaining ultra low latency. So a few things there, you know, when you're on your exam and you see a question that says that you need ultra low latency, you know, that might push you towards a network load balancer. So it's really key to understand things like, you know, which which protocols would you use? What features do you need? Do you need host-based routing or path-based routing? That's going to push you to ALB. Do you need ultra-low latency, the ability to terminate TLS connections? That can, that's going to push you to NLB. So really key to understand these facts and worth going through the FAQs for these different load balancers to really understand the differences. So let's go in. I'm just going to call this my NLB. And you'll notice that though the protocol options now are only TCP and TLS, it still comes up with 80 by default. So of course you can still use HTTP web servers running on port 80 with your network load balancer. Uh, like I said before, it just won't have some of those abilities like being able to do the path-based and host-based routing because that requires application layer inspection of the packets, which the NLB doesn't do. But you can choose TCP and you can choose TLS. And if you choose TLS on the next screen, you'll see that you need a certificate. Now I will do this in a later lab, so we're not gonna do that for now. Let's just go to TCP, and I've selected an availability zone, and one of the things you'll notice here is under IPv4 address, I have two options. Now, if you go back and have a look at a ALB, you won't have these two options. You have assigned by AWS only. You cannot choose an elastic IP address, but here we can. So I'll choose an elastic IP, and I already have that one, which we allocated a few minutes ago. Another thing to notice here that's different is I can now click Next, and it's fine. Even though I've only selected one AZ, you can't do that with an ALB. You must select at least two AZs. I'm going to select another AZ as well just to show you something. I want to leave this as assigned by AWS and click next, but it won't allow me to. So it says elastic IP addresses must be distributed evenly across enabled subnets. So it looks like you need to have an elastic IP for each of your AZs. So you either use elastic IPs or you just stick with the assigned by AWS and then you can go forwards. In this case, I'm going to remove that subnet and change this back to an elastic IP. Gives us the warning about not having a secure listener. So now we're on target group. I'm just gonna call this TG1. 
One of the differences that you'll notice now with the target group as opposed to the application load balancer is we don't have Lambda functions as a target type. We only have instance or IP address. Now I'm going to choose IP address just to do things a little bit differently in this lab. So one of the other things you'll notice here is the default health check protocol is TCP. And the defaults are slightly different to when we're using an application load balancer. But we can change this, so we can still put in HTTP and give the path to our index.html file. So we're just going to do that. We're going to change our threshold for our healthy threshold back to two. So this just means that you need two intervals of 30 seconds to bring this instance into the healthy state. So in other words, the application or sorry, the network load balancer will check index.html and if it can find that file, that's one success. And then 30 seconds later, it will do it again. And that's two successes. So at that point, it will bring the instance into service. And we can change that down to 10 seconds on the NLB as well, which is another slight difference to the application load balancer. So I'm going to do that. That will be super fast. And we click, click on Next. And now we can put in our IP addresses. I'm not going to do it here. I'm going to do it from another screen. But this is how we register our targets. So we register our instances. And we're allowed to put in an IP address from a VPC subnet. So let's just click Next, click Create. So we now have that network load balance. So let's just go up and check how our instances are getting on. So we have two instances. They're both in the same availability zone. I just want to grab that IP address and let's have a look. And that's not working. That straight away tells me that I might have missed something here. So let's go and have a look at the security groups. Sure enough, when we set up those instances, I didn't select the web access security group. And that's an easy mistake to make. And whenever you see that timeout, that's usually what's happening. So let's just go back and we'll click on both instances and we can quite easily just change the security group. So now we should have that access. Let's go back and there we are. So this time we get this HTML page and it says this is Katina. And I'm now going to grab the IP address of the other instance. And let's just paste that over the top. And we've got Joette. So we've got those two instances are now up and running. So what I'm going to do, I have one of the public IP addresses of an instance in my clipboard. Let's just go back down to target groups. And we can have a look at this target group that says target type is IP. So let's try and register a target. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to click on add and I'm going to put in the IP address. Now straight away you see IP address must belong to an existing subnet. So what it's telling me is this public IP address isn't allowed. And the reason being what we need to use is the private IP address of the instance. So this is very much as per the diagram. And it's the same with the ALB, the NLB, and the CLB. Even if you have a public facing or an internet facing load balancer, and it has its own public IP addresses, whether they're visible to you or not, you always, or the network load balancer will always route to the private IP address of the instance. Despite the fact that these are public subnet instances and they have their own public IP addresses. So we'll pull that out. We'll just go back, and this time what I want to do is take the private IP address. I'm just going to paste that somewhere and then grab the private IP address of the other instance as well. And let's go back to target groups. and click edit here, click on add, and I'm going to paste in, add to list. Same again, add to list. And now we have these two IP addresses and we can click register. 
they've been registered successfully so now we can go back to target groups and we can have a look and they're in the initial state at the moment so while that's happening I'll just quickly head over to load balancers remember this is where you get your public DNS name so just as with the other load balancers you have the same type of public DNS name I'll copy that and we can try and go there we might not um, have those instances yet it is a bit faster remember we've only got two consecutive health checks to do with 10 seconds between them so it should be quite fast let's look back at target groups it's still an initial if you look at health checks we can just review what we've done here check this is all correct slash index.html we know that's the that's the that's definitely a, a file that we have on that on those instances threshold is 2 interval is 10 let's go back taking a bit longer than expected let's try again here right so now we can see there we've got Joette and let's see if we cycle through now you'll see the behavior is a bit different though it might be that, that both instances aren't in service yet let's just come back and give those a little bit longer but while that's happening I just want to go and have a look at a couple of other settings so if we head to the load balancer one of the things you'll notice is cross zone load balancing is not enabled so cross zone load balancing is a feature which we're going to cover in detail in a subsequent lab so I'm going to show you the differences between the different load balancers and how this setting actually affects the behavior of the load balancer and how it distributes connections to the backend instances. But one of the things to know now is that the application load balancer always has this enabled. You cannot disable it, there's no option. Whereas with a network load balancer, it's not enabled and um, you can then enable it. With the classic load balancer, it's enabled by default when you create the load balancer through the console and you can disable it and when you can create the load balancer from the command line it's actually not enabled by default so you have to specify that you want to enable it so let's just go back and see are we cycling we're not cycling through our instances we're just sticking on Joet. let's have a look at our target groups come back to our targets still showing as initial and there we go I just refreshed and now both instances are healthy so it took a bit longer than I expected it to but they're there and let's go back now and let's see the behavior okay so we're not changing with every refresh in this instance we seem to be sticking with Joette and now it seems to cycle to Katina and, and stick with Katina for a while so definitely a different behavior we'll see more of this when we go into the lab on cross zone load balancing later in this section so that's it for this lab just wanted to show you some of the differences between the network load balancer as opposed to the other two types of load balancer um, we, we've finished with this now so let's just go to the load balancer first we can hit delete we're going to go to target groups and we can then delete our target group I'm then going to go up to instances and remove these instances or terminate these instances and then I'm going to go down and release my elastic IP address so that I don't pay for the elastic IP address so you first need to disassociate the address you might find that you just have to wait a couple of minutes this should then disassociate and you can then release the address which is grayed out at the moment so just give that a bit of time I think the load balancer is still attached to this in some way in the background so um, even though our load balancer appears to have gone um, just wait for a few minutes and then you should be able to release that yeah not yet but um, that will just take a couple of minutes so that's it um, you can leave those files the index and the names file in your S3 bucket because we're going to be using those in subsequent labs